I'm Kay Renfro. I'm the court administrator for Beaverton Municipal Court in Beaverton, Oregon. That is just outside of Portland. I'm also the uh, president of the EVAWACA, which is the Oregon Association for Court Administration. Um, I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Peter Kiefer has worked for the Mariposa Superior Court since 2001. First as the criminal court administrator, then as regional administrator, and now as civil court administrator. Before that, he was a manager of the Trial Court Programs Division for the California Administrative Office of the Courts and director of Trial Court Programs for the Division of Oregon State Administrator's Office, where he worked for almost 15 years. Mr. Kiefer was also president of Awaka, and we have a um, scholarship still in his name for that state, so we appreciate Mr. Kiefer uh, very much there. Mr. Kiefer has worked on an overseas rule of law assignments in Liberia and Beirut, visited the People's Republic of China as a court administrator representative, and co-edited the court manager ethics columns for many years. He has also conducted over a dozen ethics presentations around the country and overseas. He received his bachelor's degree from Santa Clara University and his master's of public administration from the University of Southern California. The Honorable Susan Sabers was appointed to the circuit court judge in January 2013. She serves in the second judicial district, pardon me, circuit in Sioux, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Judge Sabers has been in private practice of law since 1997. She has been a member of the South Dakota Board of Bar Examiners since 19, pardon me, since 2002, and has been chair since 2009. She is also a member of the State Bar's Law School Committee. She served as president of the Second Circuit Bar Association from 2001 to 2002. Judge Sabers has worked as a hearing examiner for the Board of Regents and Board of Medical and Osteopathic Examiners, and she has been named a Special Assistant Attorney General to assist in the defense of state agencies. She earned a political science degree from the University of St. Thomas in uh, 1992. She attended the University of South Dakota School of Law, where she was an editor for the South Dakota Law Review and was a Thomas Sterling Honor Graduate in 1995. Carl E. I always pronounce this wrong. <laughs> we'll say Thomas. Okay, I mess it up every time. The third is currently court administrator for South Dakota's Second Judicial City Circuit in Sioux Falls. Previously, he served as court administrator in St. Cloud and Todd County in Minnesota's Seventh Judicial District in his supervisor and staff positions with the Alaska court system in Anchorage and Palmer. His past work also includes writings on ethics and Nakam's court manager. Mr. Thonis, pretty good. Um, has served as speaker or panelist on a range of topics in court management in various state, regional, national, and international programs, including NACOM, university and law, school classes, and other professional conferences and associations. His international work includes presentations for the Pacific Judicial Council Conference in Guam and the World Ethics Forum in Oxford University in England, sponsored by the World, <coughs> excuse me, World Bank of the International Institute of Public Ethics. He is a primary editor for the Court Ethics Organization. He has been a member of NACOM since 1993 and has served on the Ethics website and Publications Committees. He is a member of the American Society for Public Administration and International Association of Court Management. He was elected to the NACOM Board of Directors in 2012 and is Vice Chair of the Ethics Committee. Mr. Thonis is, the, is an Institute for Court Management Fellow holds a Master of Science in Public Administration from University of Alaska, and has completed two graduate seminars on comparative public policy and government in Sapporo, Japan, both as a student and a guest speaker. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. The next hour or so, uh, talking to you about ethics codes and how they apply to some very specific practical situations. Um, before we start, we want to uh, share with you uh, a couple of features about our uh, presentation. First of all, uh, just to warn you to be prepared that we conduct a highly interactive session. So we really rely on a lot of audience engagement, and we know we can count on you. So actually, this program doesn't work all that well unless 
we have a lot of interaction. So please, we welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> Peter's uh, discussion about logistics reminded me that. <clears throat> It says on. I always reassure myself that the film gates at one of the big Microsoft companies have problems. This isn't the type of thing. How's that? There we go. Ah. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks very much for coming. You are all the diehards because, of course, this is after lunch, and so there's a strong temptation to sort of slack off in the afternoon. So I appreciate your diligence and your energy. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, and, and thank you for that introduction. I, I think of two things. First of all, I need to cut that down because nobody cares. I'm not even sure my mother would care about some of that stuff. And second, um, you know, this is inside baseball, but during the, the intro, um, our, our very kind uh, host started to say something about Sioux City. If you live in Sioux Falls, you know Sioux City is meh. It's highly <laughs> undesirable. It, it, their, their airport code is, I'm not making this up, their airport code is S-U-X. Oh, <laughs> man. So, so I, I, I appreciated the, uh, the, the on-the-fly correction to Sioux Falls. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. We're here today, today to talk about ethics. Peter and I have done this uh, just a couple times before, um, and Judge Sabers is with us today, uh, thankfully, to give us a judicial perspective, a piece that we've not included in the past that I think has a great deal of value. I know those of us who have paid attention to ethics in the courts for a long time know we have, we've had some of these discussions for years, and the piece that's been missing for years is, is that judicial perspective. You know, we get in these rooms, we talk about court employee ethics and standards and conduct rules and that sort of thing, and the big piece we've missed, we've missed for so long is that black robe piece. And so hopefully we've, we've filled that gap today. Um, l let me talk about um, the importance of ethics and, and court administrator presiding judge partnerships and, and sort of warn you about something that um, those of you who have been in Peter's and my sessions before, you know we talk uh, at the outset about um, the right answer. So many of us want clarity. We work in legal environments that are where language has to be really precise. We want clarity. Uh, we want clarity in rules and statutes and conduct codes. So often we'll get comments on evaluations like, please tell me the right answer, please. And we, we're not here to do that, and in fact we can't do that, because as so many of us know, it's so, it's so dependent on circumstances, it's so dependent on your jurisdiction, it, it's so gray. And so you may think as we go through this, I know some of us intrinsically love ethics and, and we get a charge out of these discussions, but some of us are in here to try to get some clarity. And I know these sessions frustrate some people who want some clarity and they'll, they'll come out of it with just, oh, please tell me the right answer. And if all we do is sit in a room and debate these things, what, what's the point? What good does that do me? Well, we hope that the good that it does you is that when you think these through for yourself, in the context of your jurisdiction back home, with your judges back home, with, with the expectations they have, with the rules you have, with the conduct codes you do have, if you have conduct codes, having thought these things through and having thought through the debates we're gonna have here today, um, we hope that will equip you to come to strong, reasonable, well-founded conclusions yourselves. Judge? Uh, Carl said we won't promise you answers, and we won't, and we apologize for that. But as part of the handout for this session, we have the AJS Code of Conduct, we have the NACOM Code of Conduct, and we've actually included the Arizona Code of Conduct, too. So you at least have some rules to look at. And with every scenario we discuss today, we will be discussing those rules. Again, no great clear line answer, but, but part of what we're doing here today is making sure that when we bump into ethical issues, we at least recognize them as ethical issues. Because I think as we discuss here today, you'll think, wow, I hadn't really thought of that, or that's never happened to me, and I'm glad it's never happened to me. So if we can at least issue spot and realize that there might be a rule out there that discusses it, we've at least moved forward in the right direction. So we've got a couple of scenarios. The first one's about growing marijuana and working for the court system as well. 
For those of you who aren't in Colorado or Washington, please don't dismiss it. Think of it more broadly as outside employment, because we bump into that issue a lot, right? Uh, so, so think of it in terms of outside employment, and we'd like to invite up our actors for our first scenario, which is called Fred's Farm. Hi, my name is uh, Fred Reynolds, and I'm currently supervising the traffic office of a large metropolitan municipal court. Um, I don't get paid what I'm worth in my court, and uh, as a result, uh, my daughter, my middle school daughter, and I are forced to live with my parents on their farm about 20 miles outside of town. In order to make ends meet, I, I can't tell you how humiliating it is to have to have my parents help me, um, because I just don't make enough money. The court doesn't pay me what I'm worth. Because they have a very large farm where they grow flax and alfalfa, uh, they have a given me the opportunity to maybe use some of their property, given our state's recent approval of uh, license-based or licensure for growing marijuana. And so I'm very excited about this business opportunity. Uh, they're willing to loan me or rent me a, a couple of acres, and so uh, I'm going to get started on this. Um, now, my, my sister uh, actually works nights over in one of our local watering holes. And uh, she's uh, uh, offered to go ahead and work with me uh, during the day to make sure the watering and the electricity and everything is good to go. Uh, so uh, that, that's really kind of where we start. Um, I'm Sarah Reynolds, as Fred mentions. I, I, I'm the sister. And um, yes, I work um, nights. And you know, Fred and I talked about this plan. And he's, he's pretty conservative. Um, and he was a little hesitant at first. But, you know, I've seen Fred work in this court for years, and he's never getting ahead. Uh, he's not able to do the things with his daughter that he would like to do. And so I, I really encourage um, Fred to get into this business. And I actually did a lot of research online where I found um, an alternative to getting a bank loan. It's a it's a crowdfunding loan, and I think that's a that's a really good idea that we're going to pursue. And also, um, I am a I'm a baker, and I am sure that some of you have seen the program Weeds. And so I think this is a perfect partnership because during the day I can help out with the farm, but then I can take some of the product and make brownies, cookies. <laughs> I really think this is a, a perfect idea. So obviously, based on the state's recent action, I'm very excited about this new business proposition. Uh, but as a loyal and dedicated court employee, I, I felt the need to, to tell our court administrator that, you know, this is kind of my plan, my business plan, when I'm not at the court. Um, and uh, Ms. Sweeney went uh, ballistic. <laughs> I'm Thelma Sweeney, and I told Fred to just forget about growing marijuana and working in the court at the same time. It just can't happen. You can't have both. You're not going to grow marijuana and work in my court at the same time. OK. First off, this is not your court. <laughs> this is the people's court. And the people have said it's OK to grow marijuana if you have a license. I am applying for a license. I think this is entirely appropriate. I don't think it's any of your business. <laughs> I don't care if it's legal in this state at this point in time. It is impugning the integrity of the court to have an employee there. What would happen if someone purchased pot from you who didn't, wasn't legal to use it? What if it found its way into the hands of the child? What if someone was driving and under the influence of marijuana that you sold them and showed up at the counter of our court? We can't have that happening in our court. Ms. Sweeney, with all due respect, you've given this a one-dimensional analysis here, OK? Um, you haven't asked me for my business plan. We, I haven't even told you whether I'm going to be directly selling this to anybody or whether I am going to be selling to a dispensary. You know, you haven't given me an opportunity to share anything about my case. Uh, this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is if I was selling tobacco, are you going to hold me responsible for kids who smoke cigarettes? If I go to the Walmart and I'm selling ammo and firearms, are you going to, sell, are you going to hold me accountable for what people do with what they purchase from somebody else? This is absolutely ridiculous. Growing pot is legal as long as I have a license. That's it. It may be legal, but it's newly legal in this state. 
and it still calls into question, we want to always stay above reproach in the court, and although it may be people choosing to have pot legal, that doesn't mean that court professionals should be doing that as a sideline on their work. Now wait a minute. Glenda, the supervisor of our small claims unit, currently is a bartender in the same watering hole that my loving sister works at. <laughs> And that doesn't impugn the court? I mean, th there's a higher likelihood that Glenda is going to get into a bar fight that I'm going to get into trouble selling pot at, while growing it legally with a license. I, I, I fail to see. It, well, your argument has a lot of potholes in it, OK? No pun intended. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. <laughs> I'll pun my word. <laughs> this is absolutely not up for debate. You cannot grow marijuana while working in this court. Sarah, I, I, I've got a problem. Um, listen, how would, you, how would you feel about maybe taking the lead on the business and my helping you out? I mean, maybe this is going to be the best way we get around this particular issue. <laughs> OK, so let me understand this. You want me to take the license uh, out to grow marijuana, and then you be the kind of the silent partner in the background? That's exactly oh. what I'm Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Fred, you seem to be awfully hardcore about this uh, situation. Cannot you see any of Thelma's uh, perspective on being the court administrator for this court and maintaining the dignity and respect of the court? Don't you? You don't seem to have any perspective on that at all. Well, look, look, all, with all, all due respect to Ms. Sweeney, okay, I appreciate that out of the gate she has to ask the question. Uh, and, and I appreciate that she's looking out for the perspective on the court. But the fact of the matter is, I think that her position, without listening to any of my business plan, without listening to anything that I want to do, is very one-dimensional. I mean, the fact of the matter is, this is legal. This is absolutely legal. What is the problem? Whether I go home and I'm, I'm growing tomatoes or I'm growing pot, it shouldn't make a difference. Miss hmm? okay. Sweeney, I have a question. So Fred said that his pay was lousy, so you're not paying him enough to begin with. He's forced to live at home with his mom and dad, and he's struggling to support his child. Is it really fair to hold Fred to a higher standard just because he works in your building as opposed to any other citizen that can go out and get the grower's license? I think it is fair to hold him to a higher standard. I'm not saying he can't have external employment. I'm just saying that employment can't look poorly on the court. And how does this? Your, your state legislature has voted, has set the public policy for your state, and has said this is acceptable. How does that reflect poorly on the court? I think it's the overall public perception of something that's been newly legalized and hasn't been fir firmly vetted. It's, very different in my eyes than somebody tending bar. Um, and I think that it's too new and too unvetted and too many things are likely to happen that may even wind up reversing the legality of it. So I'm just curious, Thelma, I mean, is this an ethics issue or is it just, just a newness issue? You're just afraid of this because it's new and untested or you really see this as an ethical uh, question? I see it as an ethical question, and the newness of it kind of folds into that, okay. honestly. Right. Um, so within our ethics code, we do hold all of our employees to mm -hmm. a higher standard and expect them to be as much as possible above reproach. Okay. So uh, uh, even though, I guess, just not drive the recording guy, not the um, <laughs> So in other words, y you think, because even though you only pay him from eight to five, that, that you have some authority, some control, some level of influence over what Fred does after he walks out of your building at five o'clock? If it looks poorly on the court, yes. And we have an employee ethics code that supports that, that he's very familiar with and has been familiar with for all the years he's been with the court. Okay. Um, Sarah, I had a question for you. Um, You've really gung-ho on this thing. You want to help out your brother, and this looks like a really exciting new opportunity. Any concern at all at the fact that Fred couldn't go to a bank and get a loan? He had to go to a crowdsourcing, uh, crowdfunding website and get uh, investors who are pretty unknown, possibly pretty shady. And by the way, what do you do with all the money? 
I understand you can't even go to a bank and deposit this because the banks won't take the money. So you're dealing entirely in cash? Well, I think that's a very good, uh, good question. And as you know, uh, culture doesn't change overnight. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that um, the business potential here can be overlooked. I mean, this has enormous potential. And okay. I do recognize that um, the mainstream banks are, are just simply not going to help out, even though it's legal in the state. Okay. But you know, I envision this to have so much potential that Fred could ultimately quit his job. I mean, his his pay at the court would be pocket change compared to, um, you know, the potential financial um, yeah. improvements. Thelma, that'll certainly solve your problem, won't it? <laughs> so. you know, Sarah, Sarah, speaking of money, Fred, you mm -hmm. mentioned that if the court paid him more, he wouldn't necessarily have to do that. So in other words, the more the court paid you, the more of the audience you would have to I, I don't think that's the issue. I mean, certainly I would like to be paid. I, I think I contribute greatly to the court, and I would like to be paid handsomely for that. But that doesn't take away from the issue of operating a home-based business under the law. And I think I have an, you know, I, I, I think our courts would protect my equal protection to do something like that. So I, I don't think that's the issue at all. Certainly. I mean, this is a business proposition my sister and I are working towards. You know, and, and you know, perhaps I don't want to work in the court for the rest of my life. So the money would be great. It might lessen the loan we've got to take. But the fact of the matter is, I should have that option open, just the same as I should be able to go to the sporting goods store, the Walmart, and sell guns and ammo. So we'd like to invite any of you who have any questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Fred. What you You're a federal that? agent, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my, my business proposal is to grow marijuana and to sell it to a dispensary who will go ahead and provide that elsewhere. My plan is not to transport this over state lines. Um, I, I, I do feel pretty strongly that under the state I can do this. And so, you know, I think the culture will change nationally uh, as more states adopt this kind of law. And I, I think we have to start someplace. So, other questions? You know, I, I certainly understand why it's a concern for the court. You know, but the, and, and I sort of drill down, I and mean, of course I'm over the traffic office, but I, I look at it from a specialty or treatment court standpoint. I mean, you know, that's kind of the filter I use. And so, you know, does it feel awkward or look awkward that one of the court's supervisors is growing and selling marijuana while we at the same time operate a treatment court? How will that look to them? At the end of the day, because medical marijuana is legal, those aren't the folks we're going to be dealing with in drug court. We're dealing with the people in drug court who've committed crimes based on their drug usage, and probably not marijuana anyway. So part of your treatment plan does not involve handing out your marijuana grower's business card to the people coming out of the drug court from your very We'll do a bake court. sale. We'll okay, do a bake well, sale to good. support Yeah, it. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Right, and the, and the main concern, well, first of all, our ethics policy says if you have outside employment or even volunteer um, activities outside that you report them to the court to look at conflict of interest as well as ethics kinds of issues. So I'm not sure that if somebody were an employee of the court and wanted to go be a stripper that we would look favorably on that either. That's also legal. Um, so it really has to do <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, the, uh, 
but it really has to do with how the court is perceived and trying to maintain that public trust and confidence um, that court staff are going to be held to a higher standard and mm -hmm. are going to be without impunity. Did I see another hand over there? Oh, yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, I agree that that's kind of a point, fine point, and I think that's part of the reason that I uh, stress the newness of it. Um, there, when, when you look at the societal um, framework for bartending and use of alcohol and the laws surrounding that, that's pretty far vetted. And so when that person reported that job, we said okay to that outside employment. This is very different because of all of the different things surrounding it and the fact that so much that goes out beyond it is illegal, even though the growing of it is not. Okay. It's a fair point. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't. Anything else? Um, Want to thank our courageous actors. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very, very much for, for getting up and doing that. So, all right. Next question then becomes What do the ethics codes say? How close do they come to this situation? So, National Association for Court Management Code, our own code, a court is a court employee, court professional's primary employment. This is the first thing that every court employee should be thinking about, is how does their work for the court affect anything else that they do, particularly outside employment. <clears throat> um, Canon 3.1, a court professional shall not, shall avoid outside activities including outside employment, business activities, even subsequent employment and business activities that negatively reflect upon the judicial branch and, and on one's own professionalism. And, and on the sure. negative reflection here, folks, I think w we heard her repeatedly say, hey, this is new, and we had someone out here say, you know, stripping's not so new. If newness has any part in this discussion at all, I think it's in reflect negatively. Because today, you people are probably 50-50. Some think, okay, fine, legalize it. Some people think not. But maybe in 20 years, everyone in this room would agree it doesn't reflect negatively. So if newness is an aspect at all for consideration, I think it's implanted there. How many folks, show of hands, your state on the horizon, either recreational or medicinal? I mean, that, that's over half the room, folks. So, so it's certainly coming down the pike. But, but make it easier and make it, um, there, there's a slide coming up that says that as an employee, you have to inform the administration of your outside employment. So anybody here that thinks if I call up my Chief Justice of the South Dakota Supreme Court and say I'm going to start moonlighting at Hooters in small orange shorts, <laughs> any, anybody think that's going to cut? Cut it? No, right? But, but one of the standards we're about to see says we shall inform. It does not say we're going to get permission. It does not say we're going to seek permission. It says we shall inform them before we take that employment. So this is supposed to happen as here. He's in the process of getting his license. He hasn't started the farm yet. He, he brings it up before he enters the employment. American Judicature Society. Now, this one, I, I should make a note about this AJS code. It was one of the very first codes ever written. It came out in about 1989. And you'll see it echoed in codes in the states that have adopted codes ever since. It, they did, I think, from my perspective, an inspired job in the beginning. Um, they laid out some of the themes you see in almost every court's code in every state now for the states that have codes. Um, appearance of impropriety, uh, political involvement, outside employment, those sorts of perennial themes that we all encounter in these ethics discussions. But here's the, I, I think, 
even though this was an inspired work at the time, I think it, it, it's decades ago now, and I think it's, th there are parts of it that aren't necessarily aging well, and one of the reasons why I think this one may not be aging well is, you know, it talks about primary employment. Uh, I'm not sure there's a consensus at all on what that means. Okay, primary employment, so what? What, what does that even mean? Um, does anybody, Anybody here have a primary employment or, or any language like that in any of your codes, for those of you who have codes? That, that the court's supposed to be your, your main thing? Well, but, but is yeah. main thing hours? If Fred works 40 plus hours at the court system and only is putting in 20 hours on the, far, on the farm, is that his, is, does the court system remain his primary employment? Let's reverse it. Fred makes $22,000 with the court system, but he makes $122,000 through the medical marijuana. Is that still his primary, is, is the court system still his primary employment? So it is, it's an interesting word choice. Um, you know, it, what you wanna know is what the court in your state is going to say. W what do your rules say? Are you under the AJS rule? Are you under the NACOM rule? What rule are you under, if any? I mean, Carl and I are here. We don't have, we've, we've not adopted any of these codes in South Dakota, so hey, I think we can do pretty much whatever we want, folks. So, <laughs> but, but if you've got a court in your state, you're gonna wanna see what they think by primary employment, because there's an awful lot of different ways you can define that. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, uh, Mark. I think by definition, it's telling you it is your primary employment. They are defining employment. And, and Mark, in your idea, when it says primary employment, that doesn't necessarily mean hours or income then. It means it, it, means it takes the highest priority in, in all your obligations. Mm. And, and we're gonna see that language in an upcoming rule that says, by the way, these ethical rules take priority over all others. So if you think your state legalizing marijuana gives you the all clear, maybe not, because we're gonna see a rule that suggests otherwise. Mm -hmm. Phil. Yes. Oh, you know, that, that you put your finger on such a cool point. Um, often in these ethics discussions, we talk about um, whether income um, establishes, uh, wh whether how much we pay you give, buys the court the right, essentially, to, to establish higher ethical standards, which is a really fascinating question. Another fascinating question is, does your place in the org chart, does it depend on how high your box is as to what your ethical standards are? And, and a f this is a fascinating detour that we don't have time for today, but um, there have been some studies that, that pretty clearly and easily demonstrate, and I think it'd be intuitive to all of us, that so often in the courts, we establish the highest ethical standards at the bottom of the org chart, and there's this weird inverse relationship that the higher you climb, the more freedom and discretion you have. And it's, it's just an odd flip when we think this through. Because, you know, as Judge Sabers mentioned, I, we, we could goof off at this conference. We, we have a lot of freedom and no codes, in, uh, conduct codes in South Dakota at all for court employees. And so we, we could have a lot of freedom, but I know the restrictions on a deputy clerk entry level in my organization are a lot higher than the restrictions on me. And, and isn't that a bizarre backwards position for us all to be in? Anyone here in the room more troubled by the fact that Fred was a supervisor? Hmm. Is it better or worse if he's the entry level? He is a supervisor in the traffic division. Does that make his situation worse? A lot of head mm -hmm. nods. Good question. Wouldn't you say, though, I mean, we talked about image, you know, to, to use Washington politics language, it, it's sort of what they call the optics of this situation. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, regardless of how you come down on the legalization issue, a lot of people would say that, that there are certain lines of extracurricular activity that, that don't look good. Hooters, stripping, 
um, working in a bar, um, medical marijuana, whether you think that's legitimate or not. So, so there, there's a problem with the appearance here. I mean, I think all of us would, would grant. And, and so I think that's the struggle. And it's a struggle I think we're gonna have to find, work mm -hmm. through in the, in the months and years to come. Uh, not only in the border states now, states that border legalization and states, but. Merely legalizing marijuana doesn't fix the appearance issue. Right. Now time might, again, is that the newness factor? Maybe mm -hmm. in 20 years, we've fixed that. I, I don't know, it depends where you come down on the issue. Right, yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a to your supervisor status making a difference. I don't know if it does for this particular scenario, but I had an employee some years ago in a former court who was a domestic relations case processing clerk, and her outside employment was supervising visitation in the community who badly needed it for a small rural poor. And that was a problem for us that she couldn't be both because she was going to see those same customers. Yep. The overlap isn't, space. yep, the overlap isn't nearly yeah. as great there, is it? Yeah. So when you're a supervisor, you have more um, breadth, I guess, and touch within the organization. So depending on the scenario, it does matter if you need both that element. Kent, do you have? Right, and, and you know, one of the interesting things that came up in this morning session, we were talking about those states that didn't have codes, like South Dakota, and, and a number of others, not many, but a number of others. In those states, most of the time, the Supreme Court has adopted uh, the American Bar Association's model code of judicial conduct. Some states have adopted it in full, some in part, but in any case, um, there's a provision in there, one of the few provisions that talk about court employees, it's a provision that says something like, to paraphrase, uh, judges should hold court employees to the same standards to which they apply, to them, that they apply to themselves. Well, so what would that look like in reality? In reality, I suppose that would look like if Judge Sabers were to call the chief and say, Chief, I'm going to go work at Hooters, I mean, he'd burst out laughing. He would think it's a joke. No judge would be allowed, or, or we would not never. Not just because of the orange shorts, people. <laughs> not I, I mean, it would sort of be a no brainer. It, it, it wouldn't even be up for discussion whether that was appropriate for a judge, for whatever reason and rationale there may be. It, it just wouldn't be contemplated for a judge. But we have these discussions about court employees, about whether it's appropriate for a court employee. Now, if we're going to apply that ABA standard, that we hold the court employees to the same standard as the judges, well, then we ought not to have a debate about the court employee working at Hooters either. And we do, we clearly do. And so th that's a really hard one to apply in itself. And so for those states that don't have codes for themselves, it, it, that, that ABA code, from my perspective, doesn't get you too far. Yeah. So. We gotta go. Yep. Yeah. Here, here's my favorite, folks. And this is 1989, AJS. You know, you can argue it's good, you can argue it's bad, but here it is. The employee shall inform. Wow, that, that does about 20% of what needs to be done here, right? I mean, there has to be a discussion and there has to be some sort of approval process, but this just, the, the onus here is simply a duty to inform. I, I think that does not get the job done. No. Okay, what Shall inform it is not enough, not enough. Just, just telling them, by the way, I'm gonna work at Hooters is not enough to fix the problem. Oh, to fix the problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but is, is Fred gonna report under this standard? Is, not. He's not, look at that. Where the outside employment reflects adversely on the, Fred doesn't think what he is doing reflects adversely upon the integrity of the court. Fred has no duty to inform anyone. I mean, the fact that he went to Miss Sweeney was purely gratuitous, period. Didn't have to tell anybody because he's not doing anything wrong. <laughs> 
OK. All right. Unlike South Dakota, <laughs> Arizona's got a code. Yeah, but we don't have a Hooters, so so many problems have just gone by the. <laughs> we avoid lots of problems. Yes, folks. and we have a Hooters. OK, fine. Wonderful. OK, so a judicial employee shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. So um, because we, are, we were very concerned over trying to get audience engagement, we actually had questions. Arizona Code also says a court employee shall regard uh, the ethical duties provided by this code as having the highest priority and a judicial employee shall not be influenced by the performance of court duties, by partisan interest, by both public clamor or fear of criticism. Get out there and grow that marijuana. <clears throat> so a judicial employee shall conduct outside activities to avoid the negative effect of the court and or the ability to perform court duties. Um, we certainly are no longer concerned about audience interaction. You guys have been great. So we are going to move on to our second scenario. So we'll invite our courageous second group of actors to come up and do the inside scoop. Hi, I'm Sheldon Beach. I'm judicial assistant to Judge Taylor. It's my job to make sure everything in the courtroom runs smoothly and safely. So every morning I give Judge uh, Taylor a rundown of what's gonna happen in court. And yesterday went something like this. Uh, we had four cases, so I said, Judge, uh, first case we've got Weldon, uh, uh, Wendell Snurdly, uh, attorney, uh, for the Kardashian, Kardashian versus Kardashian uh, uh, divorce case. Uh, you know, Wendell, he's always get, asking for continuances and he wants, uh, you know, he says he's going to be here, he's not going to be here, he's got to be over in Yuma. He said he couldn't make the appearance today at the court today because he was going to be in Yuma. I called the clerk, my clerk friend there. She said he's not scheduled, so I left it on the calendar. Second case is uh, Mr. Lawson. You know Mr. Lawson, he's, uh, doesn't, he thinks uh, paper money is worthless and you're not a real judge. And uh, it's just, he's made noises about this kangaroo court you run. And when he called the clerk's office, he yelled at them on the phone, and uh, he said something last time he was here, he's done with this court, and he threw papers around, so you're gonna wanna have security on that one. Um, the third case is a protection order case. You know, this is uh, the McGraws. They've filed six protection orders in the last six months. A Couple days later, they come in, they make up, they dismiss each one. Um, but uh, you should know that uh, Mrs. McGraw is related to Joni in the clerk's office. You know, she doesn't know them too well. Uh, she doesn't know about their fights, you know, every weekend, but just thought you'd like to know. And the last case we have is a pretrial for that uh, uh, trial we have going to starting tomorrow. Uh, I heard in the courthouse that the prosecution can't find its star witness, but they haven't told the defense because they're hoping to get a plea deal uh, out of them. Um, but, but if you press the prosecution about witness availability, they may, dis they may have to throw in the towel and uh, offer a real sweet, uh, real sweet deal. So that's the rundown, Judge, and that's what we got. Good afternoon, my name is Judge Arnold Taylor. Uh, Sheldon is my judicial assistant, he does a fantastic job. I rely on him uh, heavily for everything that we do in the courts. Uh, if somebody is a potential uh, dangerous person in my courtroom, I need to know about that. Uh, it's for the sake of everyone's safety in the courthouse. And as far as the attorneys go, if they get, uh, let's say, confused about what court they're supposed to be in and when, or if they have um, some bluff about a witness, I need to know those sort of things. It's a scheduling issue so that we're not wasting the court's time. <laughs> uh, okay, so I know that uh, sometimes Sheldon's information can come off to some people as uh, gossipy when he's talking about family relationships and uh, clerk st uh, court staff, but all judges need to know if there's potential conflicts. So that's information we have to have. Uh, it, 
Judges deal with information all the time, with cases, and what I get from Sheldon is no different than that. And besides, everything Sheldon tells me is factual, it's internal, and it's strictly confidential. <laughs> uh, besides, it, it's no different than a draft opinion that a law clerk would write. Uh, that's how I see things. I am attorney Weldon Snurdly. <laughs> and I am not happy. I am sitting in the courtroom here at 9 o'clock in the morning. And why am I sitting here with my client, Candy Kardashian? Well-known individual, I'm sure. Uh, and that's because uh, Judge Sheldon, oh, not really Judge Sheldon, but you know what I'm talking about, denied my continuance. Of course, it was really Judge Taylor who denied my continuance, supposedly, but we don't know that for sure. But we also know, but we, what we do know for sure is that uh, Judge Taylor takes his cues from Sheldon. Uh, so I was sitting outside of the courtroom, as I said, because uh, I, my continuance was denied, and overheard, because Sheldon forgot to close the door, um, his whole conversation with Judge uh, Taylor this morning. So now, uh, it seems that uh, Mr. Beach is calling other courts to check up on me and probably others, maybe you out there. Um, <laughs> so now, uh, with Judge Taylor's blessing or not, uh, things can occur or don't depending on, on uh, what uh, Sheldon is telling Judge Taylor. Um, so now Judge Taylor thinks that uh, one party is a crazy person another couple fights all weekend long, and uh, he's probably gonna give a sweet deal to some other, uh, some other attorney. Uh, why can't I get a sweet deal? Uh, that's what I wanna know. I'm Candy Kardashian. <laughs> I don't get it. I tried to call Judge Taylor, talk to him, Sheldon gets to talk to him. I don't, I don't understand it. I needed to tell him that my ex-husband just signed a new contract. He's a big sports guy, you know, and uh, a lot more money. He needs to know that. He talks about needing to have this information. I'm trying to give him information. He won't talk to me. The clerk says, you can't talk to him. But now I find out that Sheldon can give him all kinds of gossip, can just make things up, and give it to the judge, and I can't say anything to him. I'm not very happy about this. This judge thinks there's some guy that lives in Montana on a compound that's crazy. I live in a compound. It's in LA. You've probably heard of us. Does he think I'm crazy too? And now I have Snidely, I mean Snurdly, as an attorney. And the judge thinks he's a liar. Do I have to hire a new attorney? I don't think this is fair at all. <laughs> okay. So. First question. Really? Oh, all right, well. <laughs> okay, Miss Kardashian, uh, what about if your husband called the court yesterday and tried to have a conversation about you with the judge? Would that have been okay for the judge to take that call? Well, first of all, you have to understand that if my ex-husband is talking, he's lying. <laughs> so I would suggest, sure, moving. talk to him, but it needs to be recorded, and we need to have transcripts of it because he's not going to tell the truth. I don't have a problem with him talking to the judge. Obviously, anybody can talk to the judge other than me. <laughs> okay. Sheldon, Sheldon, Sheldon. What have we learned from this situation? Certainly the first thing is when you're going to talk to Judge Taylor, close the door. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I don't know what everyone's getting so upset about. You know, uh, Judge Taylor's a nice enough guy, but he's got you know, a lot of stuff on his mind. He's got that Hooters he owns up on Orange Blossom Road. <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's got that marijuana farm he uh, runs. You know, so it's my job to tell him, give him as much information as I can. He's a judge, he's a smart guy, he knows I'm, I'm mostly reliable, he knows what to discount and not discount, and he can just, uh, you know, he can kind of filter through it, so yeah, I'm not too worried about what I told him. Sheldon, so. is that your role? Is there any piece of information that you would withhold from your judge that you wouldn't think is appropriate to handle on? 
I think I, I, I would tell them anything that involved uh, safety in the courtroom. I would never hold anything back uh, just to make sure everyone was safe. Uh, so in regard to safety, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I wouldn't hold anything back. And, and do you believe that your conversation this morning with the judge related to safety? I think in, in one case it did. On the rest of the cases, I think I was helping with the efficiency of the courtroom. So, okay. okay. Any, things? Um, any questions out here for the group? We want to. There oh, has to be somebody here okay. you want to beat up on people. Come on. <laughs> Okay, Judge, Judge Taylor, how do you account for this extraordinary amount of information that uh, Mr. Beach gives you every morning? I like her idea that I'm not accountable. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, that works for me. Uh, no, I, everything that was in that summary I thought was relevant. Uh, so, yes, there, there would be some things that uh, wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, you know, I don't need to know what people do on the weekends or what they blog about because it wouldn't be relevant to something that's going to be in the case before me. But other things, you know, the safety issue, if there's a couple with multiple mul uh, protective orders, that could be a security issue in the courtroom. I don't know if something might break out this time that didn't the first five times. And Sheldon didn't really give me anything that wasn't already in the record. Uh, they're just reminders. Does okay. the judge have some sort of duty to say, no, no, don't want the information? Everybody agrees, yep. J yeah. Judge had a huge duty here to say, shush, this is not information that's appropriate. And it matters where the information comes from, doesn't it? I mean, the source of the information. For instance, a custody dispute in front of me, mom wants full custody, mom's drug test that I order comes back, confirms the presence of meth. Important, right? What if I'm sitting at my kid's baseball game and mom's sister sits down next to me and starts bemoaning the fact that her sister's caught up in meth? and she's using it like crazy. Not, not fair, is it? I mean, I'm not supposed to have that discussion. One happens in open court, both sides are aware of it, both sides have equal access to that information, but this is the kind of backdoor stuff that really, really is so questionable and so much harder to handle. And, and part of the burden is on you folks. You're not supposed to initiate the conversation that would prompt ex parte communication. I don't think you do. I mean, as a general rule, that's not where this comes from. It's all of the stuff that accidentally comes your way, isn't it? I mean, nobody's out there going, hey, give me the latest rumor on so-and-so because he or she's in front of my judge next week. But you're on the phone with someone and they burst out, my husband's an absolute liar. If you're gonna hear a word he says, you have to transcribe it, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that gets thrown at us and that's the hard stuff because that's the harder stuff to deal with. Okay, I wanna thank our actors. Let's uh, briefly go through what the codes are. The NACOM code, a court professional shall not attempt to take advantage of his or her enhanced access to judges and court files to further any personal interest he or she might have in a case or engage in court-related ex parte discussions with judges. Confidentiality, no court employee shall either initiate or repeat ex parte communications from witnesses, litigants, attorneys, judges, and any other person. Um, here's the thing. Th these discussions happen between court staff and judges a million times a day, all the time. Um, ha has anybody in here ever had a judge do the la, 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 don't tell me? <laughs> One more. Mark? Well, I would never, I mean, I've never done actually say something where they would ask them to do that, but I've had her, that judge, tell me that she would Mm -hmm. and, and an example I gave this morning, right now I've got a divorce before me where wife is claiming as grounds extreme mental cruelty and her allegation is that husband forced her to swing, have sexual relations with other people, or that he was going to leave her. That's her allegation. My court reporter on a break t with me one day says, oh, Judge Sabers, my mom went on a date with this guy. I want to tell you about it. Okay, and guess what, I went blah, 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 and, and I shut it down. Now, now, she didn't get to the substance. Maybe it was a great date. Maybe it was a terrible date, I don't know. And she didn't give me enough where I had to guess at it. I shut it down quickly enough. But 
Had it been something of substance, had she even said, oh, he was a terrible human being or he was a fantastic date, had she gone that far, I at least have to disclose that to the folks who are in front of me. I might have to recuse myself from the case. We didn't get that far, but I actually found myself, I didn't actually stick my fingers in my ears, but it was pretty close. I was, oh, no, no, stop, stop. That's not fair game, and, and we need to make sure, uh, you know, if you hear even one of your staff giving that information to the judge, you folks are in charge of shutting that down, and sometimes you're policing the judges because they're not as aware of these rules as they need to be too, right? So there should be more beating up on the judges probably than, <laughs> than what happens. In reality, sure. Get out and beat up on your judges. <laughs> and, and you know, here's the fascinating thing. When we first started to discuss these, th this sort of scenario months ago in preparation for this conference, um, I, I surveyed the judges in my own jurisdiction, relatively small jurisdiction. You would not believe the, the range of response I got from a judge who would say, oh, no, 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 I, I'm a judge. I weigh the admissibility of information all the time. I have people in my courtroom that says the opposing side is, is awful and evil. I, have, I, I make those determinations all the time. I want to know everything, and it is my job to weigh what's admissible, what's considerable, what's not. Other judges are far more cautious and, and say, no, no, you're, you've, you need to filter. And so it, it might be a worthwhile exercise to go back home and even ask your judges, how much of a filter do you expect us to be? What do you want to know? What do you want us to relay? How much of a barrier between you and the public do you expect us to be? And I'll bet you the answers will be fascinating because I think most judges haven't really considered this sort of scenario. Yeah, Comment back here? Can I bounce a question back to you? Because I think you put your, your finger on a point that, that not a lot of judges have necessarily thought through, and that's one of the responses I got from one of the judges on the bench, it wasn't Judge Savers, was that, um, yeah, you need to filter the litigants because they're in, in conflict with each other. They're in competition with each other. They're, they're duking it out in court. Court employees are not litigants. They have no, theoretically, preferably, ideally, no vested interest in a case, and so that's why Court employees are neutral, but these litigants aren't. That's why they need a filter, we don't. Does that make any sense to you? No, because just talk, just talk to any person about any particular attorney, and they'll give you a earful. So they are biased <laughs> the direction they're They're not biased. Yeah. yeah. So. But, but it, it's that increased access, the rule mm -hmm. that Peter read that said you can't abuse that enhanced access because not everybody gets to come into my chambers and close the door or leave the door open. Not everybody gets to do that, but if you've got that enhanced access, it's a trust issue and you gotta be careful with it. Yes, ma'am, way in the back, I think you had a... That's a, that's a fascinating one. You know, in, in the earlier session, we talked about fa you know, family relationships and, and th that sort of question, or questions like, um, if, if a, I know of a court, em well, like that came up in the scenario, if I know of a court employee's relationship to a litigant, do I tell the judge? If the judge doesn't otherwise know, I create a conflict that didn't exist in the first place. If, if the judge knows and I never told them, then I didn't do a very good job protecting that judge from conflicts, did I? And, and so making those decisions about what, what you relay, what you make available, what information you submit and not is really is one of the, the fascinating mm -hmm. discussions and debates yeah. and uh, one of the reasons why we're here today. Yeah. And, and want to comment on the Arizona code that's actually up on the, on the viewer. Uh, it says, shall not communicate personal knowledge. And, and, and I submit to you, Arizona, right on. I mean, they absolutely got it right. 
There's no comma at the end of this that says, unless, of course, you think your judge wants to hear it, right? <laughs> right? There's no qualifier here. It says, shall not communicate personal knowledge. So if you heard it in open court, well, that's not personal knowledge. This is pretty clear. It doesn't cover all the bases, all the bases but it's an awfully good place to start. Don't do it. It's personal knowledge. Don't communicate it. You're not supposed to. I think it's a great code section as a starting point. Well, we hope we've given you some food for thought. Clearly, these scenarios involve the judicial branch, and it's certainly more than simply the personnel rules that we have to deal with. And it's not just simply right or wrong answers. It's up to us to figure out what those answers are. And it's up to us to make these codes real and pertinent to both ourselves and to our employees. I want to thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, we have, we'll leave you with two uh, walk-away quotes.